we stayed well below the hobbyist rules uh, of 400 feet. Uh, we were good, but I am an employee of a public institution. And under FAA guidelines right now, only public institutions and hobbyists can fly. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, we'll talk about that at greater lengths here in a minute. But they told me I had to quit because I worked for the government, which as a journalist, I was like, hush your mouth. That's, a, that's fighting words. <laughs> you don't call me the government. Let's go to the parking lot and discuss this. Um, but then they informed me that as an agent of the state and a member of the government, I could apply for permits to the FAA and get back in the air. And I went, yes, I am the man. <laughs> the FAA, or the, the, the Daily, not so lucky. Your Metro Major Daily, not so lucky. The television station you used to work for, not so lucky. If you work for a private institution in the US, you are shit out of luck. Sorry, them's the rules, and they suck. Environmental degradation, we could do. Pollution, erosion, land development. I did a lot of stories in Florida using satellite imagery analysis looking at wetlands loss due to development. And we would go out to these swamps that had been cut off from water by this glistening new housing development up the way. And we kept saying, like, if we could just get in the air and go look at these things, we could really know something about this. And when we were doing these stories, it was like the golden age of newspapering, which is about 2004, 2005. Why do I call that the golden age of newspapering? Because nobody had figured out we were in a real estate budget or real estate bubble yet, and developers were heaving giant piles of cash at us to sell houses to people who couldn't afford them. So we went and rented all kinds of planes and helicopters and things like that. We blew thousands of dollars on aircraft. And even then, when budgets were fat, our editors were like, hey guys, Let's knock this off. Like, whoa, too much. Can't be doing that anymore. We wanted to do it dozens and dozens and dozens more times. Well, my little drone here could do it all the time and wouldn't even take that much. And I have one on here. Any, uh, any Sesame Street fans in here? One of these things is not like the other. The county fair? Yeah, actually, somebody did it. In Sonoma County, California. Now, you might look at the ground and note that it's not a very busy day at the fair. Well, that's because they did this before the fair opened. So I went out, flew around all the rides, did this nice loop around the, the, the spinning swings and around the Ferris wheel, and it's just really cool. Now, they were smart, and they did it when nobody was there. Um, but a guy went and gave the footage to the local paper, and they put it online. So it was a really kind of unique way to cover the county fair. And my first job interning at the Norfolk Daily News in Norfolk, Nebraska, I had to cover a lot of county fairs. <laughs> and I would be desperate for a new way to cover a county fair. And this could give you a different perspective. You knew there'd be problems. I've already kind of mentioned uh, them. Um, I often get phone calls from faculty at other universities. I get phone calls from general managers at TV stations, editors, uh, legal counsel for media organization, and I'm really just going to start answering my phone. Hello, Dream Crusher. <laughs> so if you have been watching this and you're like, I have got a credit card, I've got the internet, this shit is happening. <laughs> Slow your roll. Let's talk just for a moment. Um, the FAA is public enemy number one for the drone community. Because the FAA's rules right now basically say, if you're not a hobbyist doing this for fun, being compensated in no way, shape, or form, and they have tortured the word compensation to its almost illogical extremes, then you can't use them. Or you have to be an agent of the state, a, an employee of the government of some level. If you are not in those two camps, go away. The answer is no. No, no, no. And before you start, before you ask me, but what about no? But I work for a non-no. No. The FAA will not allow it. Now, recently, they find their first pilot, a guy named Raphael Kerger, who was actually flying 
around the University of Virginia campus, not too far from here, and was doing a promotional video, was getting paid for that. And they fined him 10,000 bucks for being a reckless pilot, for flying close to people. And, and now he, he would, if you've ever covered courts and you've ever had to listen to uh, witnesses be cross-examined and they go through their backgrounds and some of them have criminal histories and things like that, and you hear, you hear defense attorneys say, well, you know, a busload of nuns didn't witness this. Well, Perker is kind of the proverbial uh, not a busload of nuns. He's not completely clean in this. He's part of a group called Team Black Sheep, and they do some pretty amazing videos. You should go on YouTube and search them out. They're fun as hell to watch. But they do things like fly down the Brooklyn Bridge in traffic. They buzz the Statue of Liberty. They, uh, they fly through the cables of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, they do things like that uh, that are visually amazing, and mm, eh, the FAA kind of had it out for them for a while. So they got him on this University of Virginia thing, fined him 10,000 bucks. His attorney sues the FAA over this to get the fine overturned. And a judge actually agreed. What a judge said just a couple weeks ago was that the FAA does not have regulations. They don't exist. What they have is this kind of interlocking series of policy memos and policy guidance documents. And at their base is this voluntary set of rules that they set out for hobbyists in 1981. And they have turned that into, the FAA has the ability to fine and even arrest people for flying drones. Judge says, no, you don't have that. You don't have a definition of what a drone is anywhere in your regulations. You don't have the authority. Um, your definition of aircraft is overly broad. The FAA tried to argue that it regulates basically anything that flies, regardless of how it is powered. What that means is that long passes over at the stadium just over yonder are now uh, subject to FAA regulation. RG3 is, has to be a licensed pilot to throw a long ball. My favorite of this, my favorite one that I've heard, uh, that when somebody said it to me, is like, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't that mean that the FAA would regulate bullets? And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yes, yes, it would. What about kites? They, the judge actually kind of needled them a little bit, saying, you now are saying you regulate as aircraft, as civil aircraft, those tiny balsa wood gliders that you can buy at a grocery store. And yeah, it was, it was a pretty stinging rebuke. What it essentially did, say was the FAA has no authority to regulate drones at all. And for about 20 hours, we had the potential for complete chaos below 400 feet. The FAA has since appealed. The FAA has since reiterated their, uh, their devout belief that they have the authority to do this. They have shut down the Washington Nationals baseball team, which was flying a DJI Phantom over their spring training practice. Practice, not a game, practice. I know I sound like Alan Iverson. <laughs> not the game, not the game, practice. Um, what somebody pointed out, it's, you're flying over your private property over your employees. Now, you may have a very expensive Bryce Harper running around out there, but they're still your employees. So uh, they shut them down. The uh, East Harlem building collapsed. The, uh, there was a, a citizen journalist who took his DJI fan out there and got some pretty amazing shots. I think probably did a few things that we probably would, shouldn't be comfortable with, but, you know, potato, potato. Um, but the FAA is investigating him. Um, there was another case where another person went to a fire and recycling plant in New York, sold that video to the NBC station. The FAA is right back to status quo uh, investigating people for flying these things, sending them cease and desist orders, and considering fining and even criminally prosecuting them. The FAA has been saying for years now that they were going to come up with regulations for small unmanned systems. They were supposed to have done it in the first quarter of this year. They have delayed that to November. 
a lot of cynics in the drone community were like, yeah, we'll believe it when we see it. But I actually believe this court case is now the proverbial gun to the FAA's head, that as long as this adverse judgment is out there, as long as the risk exists that a court may undo their semi-regulatory scheme before November, they really got to move on this. And we could see them move soon. What will that look like? We don't know. We don't know. We can guess. They've published some documents that kind of give us hints. I would not be surprised at all, at all, if you want to fly these commercially. That means if you're a journalist and you want to fly these, you're going to have to get licensed by the FAA of some variety. How much training, how much expense, we don't know. You're probably going to have to submit to a background check. You will probably have to carry insurance. You will almost certainly have to submit safety data to the FAA. You'll have to report any crashes or anything like that. There are uh, a number of other things. Currently, uh, to get a certificate of authorization, I am having to go to FAA ground school. I'm having to basically start my career as a private pilot. It's costing several hundreds of dollars to do so. The other thing I have to do, I have to submit myself to a physical by an FAA certified doctor. And I'm like, why? Basically, they want to make sure that my eyes work, that I'm not legally blind, which you all just got very blurry. So uh, they want to make sure I'm not legally blind or that I'm not going to keel over dead of a heart attack any moment, particularly when I'm flying. Um, but that's another 100 bucks. And I have to have students go through this very same thing. So yes, I have journalism students that are going to FAA ground school. Um, will that be the same thing that they do when the, um, when the rules come out? Don't know. We have no idea. So the FAA, uh, some of the other things in, in a, a paper that uh, myself and Mickey Osterreicher at uh, NPPA have written, which is going to be published here in the next month and a half, um, we go into this in some depth. But there are some other things the FAA have said, like they're, gonna, they're talking about flight plan approval. They're talking about um, operational restrictions. And some of them raise the specter of prior restraint. Some of them raise the specter of unconstitutional limits on speech that we need to be concerned about and we need to be prepared for. But if you want ground zero for, unconstit or for, uh, for seemingly unconstitutional infringements upon speech, I give you the states. Um, it wasn't my line, but I'm going to steal it. Um, it's actually from the Daily Show. The state legislatures, meth labs of democracy. <laughs> Two states currently outlaw the use of UAVs for journalism. Idaho and Texas. With someone interesting being in Texas yesterday, in Austin, in the shadow of the state capitol, flying that thing around. We were indoors. I was okay. Um, in Texas, right now, it is a misdemeanor for you to fly this thing with a camera on it and take a photograph of a person or their private property without their consent above eight feet. I go about six one. Pretty much if you fly higher than this, you have now, and, and you take a picture and you put it on the internet, you distribute it, you have committed a misdemeanor crime. I am certain that people in here have seen a TV show that includes the Dallas skyline or the Houston skyline or any skyline of AC Austin. If you've ever watched anything about the city of Austin, I'm sure they have pictures of a downtown area. What Texas state law now says is that if I, as a citizen, or I, as a journalist, Take that thing, fly 10 feet in the air, and take a picture of the downtown Dallas skyline, a picture that has been taken thousands and thousands of times before. I now have to get consent of every visible private land owner in the picture. If I stood on the ground, I have no such requirement. If I get onto a manned aircraft, I have no such requirement. But, that's if I'm a journalist or a citizen, but, if I am a licensed real estate broker in the state of Texas, game on. Photograph away. 
You're just trying to sell a building. That's okay. If I'm an oil and gas pipeline owner in Texas, you know, go figure. Fly all you want. Just fine. There is an exemption for university research. There is no definition of what they consider research. So if there's anyone from the University of Texas or any of the Texas or TCU or Rice or anywhere, I know, uh, Rice, you're screwed. Um, TCU, actually, TCU, you're actually screwed. So any of the public institutions in Texas, if you're here and you're thinking, hey, we'll start a drone pooling uh, arrangement with all media in the state and we'll call it research. Warm up your general counsel's office first on that one. That one you might want to ask for permission before you have to ask for forgiveness. But um, Idaho just says nobody. State, private, whatever. If you're photographing private property, it is now civilly actionable. They can sue you for it. Four other states, actually now three, uh, uh, Washington vetoed it today. Uh, three other states are considering laws. Iowa, Wisconsin, and God damn it. Georgia. Georgia. Georgia, creative people that they are, copied and pasted Texas's law. They made one minor edit. Texas law has 19 exemptions to the drone ban. 19. One of them is they can photograph anything they want within 25 miles of the border of Mexico. Georgia, not a lot of borderland there. Although, they do have Florida, and if I were them, I'd run over the border. <laughs> uh, I live there, so I could make that joke. States are not waiting around for the FAA. And states have a very interesting notion of what the First Amendment does and does not allow. And they are doing some things that I do not believe will stand up in court. I get calls all the time from lawyers asking me, my, my friends in the kind of privacy, uh, legal drone community, ask me all the time, will you go down to Texas and go get arrested so that we can have a test case, please? <laughs> and the weird thing, I realized, I turned 39 yesterday, and I'm like, I'm kind of at a point in my life where an arrest My, my resume is pretty well set. No one's going to deny me a job if I get arrested for flying a drone. In fact, I'd probably, I should probably get jobs <laughs> doing that. I probably can't get my wife to go along with that one. The other thing is I'd probably want to pick the jail. I don't think I'd do so hot in my <laughs> Dallas Central lockup. But what'd you do, murder? What'd you do? Armed robbery? What'd you do? Flew a drone? <laughs> Mr. Badass over here. The states are not waiting around for the FAA. They're acting, and some of them are not very friendly to the First Amendment or to journalism. There was an exemption. The 20th exemption to the Texas law was actually for news gathering. The Texas State Broadcasters Association and the Newspaper Association tried to get it in there. Senate added it to the Senate bill, and in conference committee, the House stripped it out. Stripped it out. So. We don't have a lot of friends in state legislatures right now. Go figure. So be wary of that. The law itself right now is really behind on a lot of this stuff. And there's some really open questions. Now I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a couple here. Uh, I'm not, not going to dwell on this too long. Um, unless there are some lawyers in the room, which is totally want to geek out right now. Um, but where the law gets kind of interesting is some states, peeping Tom laws actually require you to physically be on the property when you are peeping. Problem solved. Doesn't take a great legal mind to fix that one. Um, the whole notion of legal privacy, the four kind of main torts of, of legal privacy, the most important one here is called intrusion upon seclusion. Now, for a legal tort to be made with intrusion upon seclusion, my lawyer friends tell me you have to be pretty brazen in what you're doing. It has to be pretty out there, beyond the pale. Taking a picture of somebody in a restaurant is not going to constitute intrusion upon seclusion. Flying a drone up to their bedroom windows or 
flying around their kid's birthday party in the backyard and buzzing over their heads and disturbing them is probably going to be intrusion upon seclusion. But another area of law that gets interesting is trespass law. A lot of private property advocates say, you can't fly that thing over my private property. Well, private property law actually is not terribly clear on this. Because for trespass to be part of this, you have to actually deprive someone of the use of that property. You have to occupy space on that property. That, that means that person can't use it. That's why you can't just go build a giant deck that just hangs over your neighbor's property. You're now blocking the sun out. You are intruding upon that. Any permanent structure is a big no. But what about an impermanent structure? If I'm flying over your property at 200 feet, am I really denying you access to your property? How many of you hang out at 200 feet above your property? Anyone, anyone? I'm looking for somebody. Somebody's gonna raise their hand and I'm gonna be on the front page of every newspaper in America because you got a gift, my friends. Um, yeah, there's no real good legal answer to whether or not you're actually trespassing at that moment. It's probably not a good idea. You're probably not gonna win a lot of friends that way, but the law is unclear. Another question I get all the time, especially when I speak, speak to community groups, is can I shoot that thing with my shotgun? <laughs> and my answers generally go like this. One, the law is actually not clear on this. <laughs> if you feel threatened in most states, fire away, Andy Oakley. <laughs> it's not very big. You gotta be a pretty good shot. I hope you've got a shotgun with some bird shot and a pretty wide spread on it, or you're not gonna come close. But the second thing I say to them after that, you know, the law is not exactly clear on that, is please do not put bullets into the air if you do not know where they are going to come down. It's just bad. Physics, things go up, things come down, bullets come down really, really fast, can kill people. Let's just all agree that that's just not a good idea. Most of them go, hmm. All right, suppose you're right. But there's a lot of areas of law that are really unclear. One area that I'm really fascinated by is that the courts, based on the First Amendment, have said that we have a right to photograph in a public place. It's why we as news people can go to a news event and photograph away. No big deal. Why we can go out on the street and take pictures of stuff. We can walk out here in the parking lot, take pictures, and nobody around has anything to say anything about it because our First Amendment gives us that right. The question I would ask is, how far into the air does that right to photograph extend? The whole idea is predicated on us being on the ground. Well, if we're interested in privacy and we don't want to intrude on people's privacy, it doesn't take much in the way of a geometry expert to figure out how high you gotta be up before you can just see right into their backyard. I tell people that all the time. I don't need to fly over your private property to see in your backyard. One, I have Google Maps too. I can already see in your backyard. People photograph your backyard all the time for other things and with other means. It's wholly uninteresting for me to photograph your backyard unless you've committed a double murder. And then it becomes really fascinating. But I don't have to fly over your private property to do that. But do I, do I have a constitutionally protected right to do that? We don't know. We don't know, probably, but how high does that extend? Where's the limit of that? Where does it become not protected, or it doesn't. The courts have said that above 500 feet, the airspace is a public street. If you can see it from above 500 feet, it's like being in the front yard of your house. You can see it. Well, is that a hard limit? Do we have to go above 500 feet? We don't know. We just don't know. Um, I would argue also that the vast bulk of the questions that a lot of people ask me about, like these private things, oh, you're gonna spy on people in your backyard. Eh, no, you know, our journalism ethics pretty much take care of a lot of those things, a lot of it. Common sense takes care of a lot of it. Where I think it gets really challenging is the cases like I was talking about before. And I was thinking about what makes that moment and the use of that thing different. Got into a discussion with a, a, a TV news uh, photographer about this. She was saying, you know, that's our bread and butter. 
Like we look for that stuff. Like those moments of, of pure emotion. Getting that stuff on TV is what we live for. It is raw humanity. And we have it on video. And you can watch it. And you can empathize and sympathize and relate or, or not even comprehend. All of those things all together. And she was making the argument that what's the difference? That's just a camera. The only difference is it flies. And in some respects, it's a, it's an intoxicating argument. That, mm, I, can, I can see where it's coming from. But for me, the difference is the noise. That sound. You're now intruding upon that moment. Because even in the worst pain of your life, if there are 15 of those things buzzing around your head, even at 30, 40, 50 feet, you're going to hear it. And you're going to stop. And you're going to look up. And you're going to be taken out of that moment. And you're going to be intruded upon in that moment. You may not have legal privacy because you're sitting in the front yard. But I would argue that we have a shared basic humanity that demands from us something more than just, is it legal or not? It demands that we think about what we're going to do and how we're treating people. And these things open up some new ground on those questions. A really fascinating question I got was from a, a major national uh, news organization. They were talking about using these in Syria and they wanted to get photos of the, the size and scale of the refugee camps. And they, they were talking about this, and I'm like, whoa, oh, wait, wait a minute. Something you may not be thinking about. These are displaced people. These are people who are going to be wary of flying things, and they are going to associate drones with conflict and even oppressive regimes. And you're now going to put it over their head. Are you sure you're not going to cause a panic? Are you sure you're not going to cause emotional harm? Are you sure you're not going to trigger some kind of stress reaction in people by doing that? And they immediately got worried, thankfully. These are the questions that I think are really interesting when it comes to journalism ethics. Because like I said, a lot, of the, a lot of the really simple stuff, you know, are you going to spy in somebody's window? Oh, of course we would. We don't want to do that with a telephoto lens. What makes you think that that makes it OK? And a lot of times I can answer these questions with, what makes you think that thing makes it OK to do something that you wouldn't do normally? You can end the discussion pretty much right there. But there are other dimensions to this that I think lend themselves to questions. Now, uh, a line that I, I used just the other day just occurred to me is that this thing right here, this is my little $500 constitutional challenge in a box. And I would honestly tell you that this presents a really interesting journalism education challenge in a box. Because it forces you to think about an awful lot of things before you do anything with it. You've got to think about the law. You've got to think about the people you're reporting on. You've got to think about aviation regulation. You've got to think about state law. You've got to think about safety of people on the ground. We have a small, low-key college football program in Lincoln. You may have heard of it. We have these small, intimate gatherings on fall Saturdays. 90,000 of my closest friends get together, cheer on our lads. You know. Tip, tip, fellas. Good job. I get asked all the time, when are you going to go cover a Husker football game with these things? When are you going to be flying around Memorial Stadium? When are you going to follow the wave all the way down the stadium? I'm like, that would be amazing. It would totally be amazing. But I'm not going to do that until I can be sure that I'm not going to hurt one of 90,000 of my closest friends. If you wear red and cheer for Nebraska, you are my friend. And these things crash. These blades are sharp. The energy that comes from these motors is significant. If I were to just walk over and stick my finger down into these blades when I get it cranked up, there's a legitimate chance I'm not getting it back. 
I'm gonna go home. Bye, honey. Deuces. I actually met a guy yesterday at, at ISOJ who uh, had one of these, and, and it was he was trying to land it on his roof. He on his roof for some reason. He didn't explain. Um, it started to slide down. He reached out to get it, and he pulled his sleeve up, and his arm was kind of hamburger right between there and there. Looked like a shark bite, honestly. Um, and part of me was like, respect. You got, you got the, you got the boom. The mark is on you. I have to live in a world where I am taking somebody's darling snowflake and putting it next to a flying lawnmower. And I do not want to have to call somebody's parents and say, I'm sorry about your son or daughter. They were pretty. They're not now. You may not recognize them when they come home for Christmas. Sorry. Uh, I actually had a student who was flying one of these before we got the letter from the FAA. Flying it out on the flat. Out of, actually, he was standing in Nebraska. The drone was actually flying over the state of Wyoming, so to give you an idea where we're at. Um, the drone did exactly what it was supposed to do. It had an electrical anomaly, uh, an electrical anomaly on board, and it went into an emergency set down procedure. But it did it in the middle of the river. And so it, he's freaking out, and flipping every switch, and trying to get it to come back, and it's just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Calls me up, freaking out. Drone's gone. All right? And I'd kind of been mentally preparing myself for this. I'm like, all right. Define gone. <laughs> it's like, it's in the middle of the plat. I'm like, it's the plat, dude. Are you going to walk out and get your shoes wet or what? Because, <laughs> nah, this is actually kind of a, this is the north fork of the plat. It's pretty deep. I'm like, all right, how deep? He's like, 10 feet. All right. He goes, yeah, we were flying there because there were these kind of logs that are down. It was creating this channeling effect. And this, you know, the closest to white water you're going to come on, on the Platte River. And it's really pretty here, but the water's really churning. I'm like, all right. He goes, I'm going to swim out and try to find it. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Slow down. I'm like, did you bring scuba gear? I'm like, you're not going down 10 feet in a river in a current, and you're going to find anything. So stop. And I made a mistake as an educator at that moment, and I made a joke. I made a joke to a student who was in a moment of panic. And I said, Ben, you're an undergrad, but you're still worth more than a thousand bucks. And he froze. I'm like, Ben, that's a joke. I'm not calling your parents and saying, sorry, I lost your son. I can buy another drone. It's fine. Relax. Come home, we'll figure it out later. There's some farmer in Wyoming who's gonna find that thing and be like, what in the hell? <laughs> I get calls from time to time from other faculty members saying, we're gonna buy one of these things and we're gonna put it in the equipment checkout room. <laughs> and I'm like, no, uh-uh. I'm like, one, bad idea, two, I encourage you to consult your university's liability insurance policy and find out how many ways this is not covered at all. Another thing we got to think about, safety of our own students, safety of other people on campus, liability insurance, our responsibility as educators to care for these kids. Like I said before, that little one that's about the size of my hand, that's the one I give the students because they can't hurt themselves or pretty much anyone else. You can fire that thing up full throttle, stick your finger in it, and it'll be like, ow. And you can do it over and over and over again. Ow, 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 ow. It doesn't hurt, really. It stings a little bit. But they have to, they have to show me they can be pretty responsible before I let them touch that thing. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do when we get that hex going. I mean, that thing is literally a flying lawnmower. So there's all kinds of things that we have to think about. That's why I say this is a journalism education challenge in a box. There are so many pieces of the discipline that this touches that we got to think about, and we have to incorporate into students thinking about this before they can use them. People ask me all the time, why don't you offer a class in this? Well, I say I have a moral, I have a moral objection to charging students tuition for a class that teaches them a skill that is illegal the moment they walk out the door. If I wanted to do that, I'd teach them how to make meth so they could make money. <laughs> That's a half joke. Um, they, 
when we get our certificates of authorization, we will probably do that. Others have chosen to go the route of, of offering class in like the ethics of drones. They've talked about um, flying just strictly inside. Fine, all, all, all good and, and reasonable. So long as you're being safe, I say rock on, man, have fun. Um, but in the very near future, this is going to be all possible. We are going to be able to fly these things. We are going to be able to use them for news. You will have them in your checkout room. Now, you might need a papal writ and an act of Congress to get it out of there, but it will be possible. I'm certain that this is inevitable. And the reason I believe it's inevitable is because these things are so inexpensive that it makes aerial photography, it makes aerial gathering of data almost, I mean, not quite zero cost, but as close to it as we can get. Whereas renting a manned helicopter is thousands of dollars per hour to rent. So the economic argument is going to carry the day here. But we need to answer a lot of questions before that day comes. I'm, you know, this is a quick aside, this is not the first time that we flipped out about technology in this country. This is the Kodak Brownie. In the 1890s, the uh, Kodak company released this camera. It was the first camera that was available to ma the masses, and people freaked the hell out. If you have ever, a number of students in here, you'll understand this. If you're a faculty member and you've ever had a friend uh, request come in from a student that you've accepted, you understand that this generation has a really different idea about taking pictures of each other at the beach than generations prior to it. When the Kodak Brownie was introduced, they posted armed guards at beaches, preventing people from taking their cameras out on the beach because people were terrified that they were going to be photographed in their bathing clothes. New York was scandalized when a photographer went into a Broadway theater and took a picture of an actress wearing a pair of tights. People flipped out about the Kodak Brownie. But like all technology, we figured out how to incorporate this into our lives, how to square it to our constitutional principles, how do we put some reasonable kind of societal and legal restraints on these things, and we stopped freaking out about it, and we wondered what all the fuss was about. I don't have my phone on me as a prop, but Imagine what those folks would be like today where we all carry around phenomenal digital cameras and the ability to broadcast that photo around the globe within a matter of seconds. We're going to freak out about drones for a while and then we're going to wonder what all the fuss is about. The next five years are going to be highly litigious. They're going to be pretty contentious. People are going to freak out. There's going to be a lot of misunderstandings. Journalists are going to make a lot of mistakes in public with them. And then in about five years, we'll have figured this out. Laws will be in place. Lawsuits will have made their way through. We'll have a pretty good idea of what this is going to look like. In 10 years, we're going to be bored with this. We're going to be straight up bored with this. I hope to see you all at Journalism Interactive in 2024 where you'll, remember, where you'll say, you remember that time you talked about drones and we were all kind of uncomfortable? <laughs> Good times. Good times. Yeah, we got 40 of them on the top of the building here. Anytime a cop call goes out to a fire or something like that, one of these just gets up and goes and sends us a text that the video is ready to go or a neural signal to us in our chip in our brain that here's the video and it comes down over your contact lens wearable and tells you, oh, that house isn't even on fire. Don't worry about it. It'll come back and sit back down. The traffic helicopter is long gone. Now we have little drones sitting on induction chargers that just take off when we do traffic on the nines. At eight minutes past the hour, it goes up in the air, probably 100 feet in the air, aims the camera towards the intersection of, oh, God, and, oh, I'm never getting to work, and turns it on, sends the signal back to the studio. The studio goes, oh, look, malfunction junction, screwed up. Pow, let's put that on the air. Looks like your commute's going to be a little rough through the corners of you're screwed and your boss is going to fire you. Um, as soon as they're done with traffic on the nines, down the thing comes, sits back down on the charger. That TV news helicopter is a four to six million dollar vehicle off the lot. To keep it in the air, it costs many hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Fuel, insurance, employing a pilot, regulatory stuff, all kinds of stuff like that. I can build a hell of a lot of those for four to six million dollars. 
I can keep an awful lot of traffic cameras in the air simultaneously and algorithmically for a lot less than that. Ten years, we're going to be completely bored with this. Of course we cover brush fires with them. Why wouldn't we? But, questions? Yeah. I have three. Do you want them all at once? <laughs> Fire away. Okay. Oh, I thought you meant three drones. I'm like, yeah, bring them on down. Let's do this. Um, number one, uh, when you were talking about FAA regulations, yes. when the rules get um, decided, like who approves those? What's the process for that? Okay, the process. Um, at some stage of the game, the FAA is going to file what it calls a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPRM. The Notice of Proposed Rulemaking will have the basic outlines of what this thing is going to do. It may evolve a little bit, but that's the big opening shot. There will be a public comment period. There will be some public meetings. There will be some input that can be had. Uh, the period of time that it takes for federal regulation to go into effect generally is about a year. So if they were to propose these in November of 2014, probably the soonest those rules will go into place would be probably November of 2015. But what's they propose, like who, like, is it, is it it's, no, the FAA. Does the FAA yes, to? yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The look of joy on your face is priceless, <laughs> so. Yes. No, I don't believe it is a stunt, but I believe that your uh, ill thought out purchases from three o'clock in the morning after you've had a few too many are going to drive themselves to your house before they're going to fly themselves to your house. Self-driving cars, you'll pardon the pun, are farther down the road than drones are, uh, which are up in the air if you want to continue the pun fest here. Um, <laughs> it is so easy to lapse into those, I'm sorry. Um, Self-driving cars are much closer to a reality than drones are. The thing, that, uh, the thing that Amazon completely, utterly, and totally misunderstood or willingly ignored was the FAA's position on a lot of these technologies. Um, one thing, uh, the Post called me up right away the next day, and, and as a journalist, you get so used to writing stories and listening for quotes, when you become a source, you actually hear yourself speaking in quotes, and it's this weird <laughs> mirror kind of holding it up to each other. Well, I said, you know, this is all fun and games until little Sally loses a finger. And I said that, and I'm like, oh, that's coming back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to see that one again. First quote in the story. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to worry about. Like, my kids, I have a, I have a seven-year-old son who's a human cannonball. He's shot out of bed in the morning. The only time he ever stops moving is when he goes to sleep at night. If he knew his birthday present was coming in on that thing, he would be of a mind to go out and jump up and grab it. And if you shove your fingers at a flying lawnmower, that's bad. And it's only a few times before some little girl going like this, who just wanted her, her little dolly a few seconds early, comes out looking like that, it's over. It's completely over. The other thing that Amazon did not understand is that the FAA has said categorically they are not allowing autonomous operations for years, years. It will be one craft, one pilot. Computers will not fly these things for years. So Bezos is talking, well, 2017, 2018? I'm like, 2025, friend, not coming soon. Um, I could go on and on about that technology, but yeah. It, it, I don't think it was a stunt, but it's a lot further from reality than, than they want to believe. Now, that may be ignorance, that may be uh, Silicon Valley bravado, but it doesn't change the fact that the business model that he's envisioning, computers flying these things, are just, it's not going to happen. He's going to have to have a, a phalanx of, of licensed pilots to fly each one individually. And at that point, why not just put them all on one truck? It's a lot more efficient. A lot more efficient. Go ahead. Uh, 100 feet, 75 feet. Okay. I mean, it's not that high. Okay, but it does become a oh, it's, issue at some point. Yeah, uh, uh, not, I mean, depending on the, on the wind and things like that, it could just, boop, it's gone. Yeah. And the second question is, uh, have you explored or have you looked at tethered solutions, blimps, tank filled with helium, and emitting nuclear noise, and some of the operational factors? Yes. 
Yes, I have, and it did not take long. Um, out on the Great Plains, we have something we call a lazy wind, which blows through you because it's just too lazy to go around you. Um, a light breeze on the plains is 20 to 25 miles an hour. A helium-filled blimp that has no real weight to it is going to be in the neighboring county before you can even get your control sticks up. So um, tethered solutions, there's a lot of debate about whether or not if you just hooked a fishing hook on the bottom of that thing and had a, had a, a fishing line going out to it, if it, suddenly it's, it's legal under the FAA. There's not a lot of guidance on that. There's not a lot of, uh, of real, honest to God, official stuff. You can sure try it if you'd like to. Uh, I'd have your general counsel's office on speed dial if you do. Um, my only worry with tethered solutions is that it takes one bad gust of wind, one person not reeling in the, the tether to keep it tight, and it's up in this thing, and this thing is going down in a heap. And God forbid you're in a populated area and you go hurt somebody. Yeah, uh, the, the only problem is with a real good wind, you're going to have to have it tethered to the top of a building sure. to keep it flying flat and true. How high, how high winds can the copters fly? Um, well, we learned, we learned the hard way that um, about a 40 mile an hour gust is enough to really blow it off track. Uh, we got very, very lucky uh, where we were out flying around in a park. We actually had Al Jazeera English there. We were trying to do some stuff with them. And we took off off the ground, and, and, and the moment that the, the landing struts got free of the ground, a 40, 45 mile an hour wind gust came along and actually blew it back into Ben, the student pilot. Luckily, it was early April, and he was wearing a very thick wool coat and some jeans, and it didn't even sting him. But that scared the crap out of me. And basically, I said, OK, we're buying a bunch of anemometers. And if it's above 25 miles an hour, forget it. We have gone out and flown around in 25. They'll get knocked around pretty good, but you can still you can still control it. You can still do pretty well. The Phantoms outside with GPS on board, they do a lot of things to try to fix to a, a fixed spot on the ground. So they'll really help you stay stable and in a in a single position. But yeah, wind is a wind is a real issue. Um, you're not going to be you're not going to be flying into the tail of a hurricane or anything like that. Really, anything above 40, 45 miles an hour is, is pretty much a no-go. So, yeah. How do you uh, navigate University of Council Street? I don't. Um, <laughs> um, actually, the University Council and I have kind of an understanding, which is I don't ask him to give me any legal advice, and he doesn't give it. Um, what really happened was the Knight Foundation gave us a grant, and the university went, oh, you're doing that? Well, I guess we can't say no now. Um, so, so long as we're kind of staying in the lines, they're okay. Um, I, sent a, I sent a very hastily written email to our general counsel's office when the Perker decision came down because I said, by my read, it is now completely legal for us to go fly around outside. I would like to call all of the local media and go fly around outside, please. And he never responded. And by the time he did not respond, the FAA had appealed and we were back to square one. But um, I have found my university's research office and by extension the, uh, the general counsel's office to be pretty supportive. Um, a lot of them actually believe this FAA stuff is kind of ridiculous. Um, but I haven't had to really test that relationship in any real significant way. So I hope to someday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if you use uh, multispectral cameras, you could do environmental stress. Uh, you could do things like um, looking at the effects of drought on different landscapes uh, using the reflective values coming up from them. That's a, that's, I mean, when you start moving into data through UAVs, you start veering into science real fast. And I have found that I have... I have compatriots in a lot of the other disciplines on campus who are very interested in using this for their own purposes. And a lot of times the purpose that they want to use them for, I can twist and turn it into news pretty quick. So I'm actually involved in a, uh, a grant project through computer science and engineering and um, ecology 
where we are building a drone that will autonomously go and take water samples at multiple locations in a water system, like a stream or a river or a lake or something like that. Go places it's difficult to reach, take a water sample. And what it is is a drone with a little, it's, it looks like a, like a revolver with these extraordinarily clean vials in a, in a canister that turns around. And it's, uh, it's got a little motor and a little microprocessor or microcontroller on there. The drone uses GPS to go to a spot, drops a, a long, clear plastic hose down into the water, sucks it up into the, drone, into the vial sitting up there, turns it, takes off, flies to the next spot, does it again, does it again, does it again. Now, my engineer friends are the ones that are programming this thing, and they, they have uh, kind of an engineering mindset. So they are conscious of its tolerances and, and things like that. There's no grace to it at all, is what I'm really getting to. There's no art to it. It takes off, and it goes over here, and it goes down, and it comes back up. And it's like, guys, you're going to scare the hell out of people this way, because it's just the thing can, and so it does. Um, and I'm like, how about we add a little, you know, I need to, wa I need to watch ballet for a little while and, and, and get the idea of swooping along and make it a lot much more peaceful. But, Water sampling, environmental monitoring, uh, multispectral imaging, laser-based uh, like LIDAR, which is going to get kind of difficult because it's generally pretty heavy. Um, in terms of ground and air, uh, we've looked at these. Uh, one real problem of sensor-based systems is trying to get data back to a central repository. You either got to spend a crap load of money on cellular technology and do it that way, or um, you have to uh, basically live under the umbrella of Wi-Fi or use some other kind of radio technology uh, like a Zigbee or something like that. Well, those all have range problems. And when you're dealing with Nebraska scale problems, we got 400 miles of nothing. Uh, and you know there are places in Nebraska that there is no cell signal, period, end of story, nothing. So, how do you go and gather that data, particularly in a largely spread area? And basically, we've, 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 we've talked about experimenting with, we've kind of drawn up documents to do this once we can get back in the air, of having ground-based sensors that will listen for a, uh, the device, and once it comes into range, send a data package off to it. That thing will gather it and store it onto the memory card on board there, and keep flying down and keep picking this stuff up, come back down when it lands, and we'll have a big data payload for us of all that stuff. Um, I work with a project called the Platt, uh, the Platt Basin Time Lapse Project. They have, time, they have 90 time lapse cameras going from the mouth of the, of the Platte at the Missouri River all the way up into the Continental Divide in Colorado. And they have to go out to a lot of these cameras and go pull the memory card out, stick it in a laptop, load all of these thousands of pictures off of there, clear it off, stick it back in there and start it back up. They do this regularly every couple of months, drive out in the middle of nowhere and pull, pull a camera out. Now, it kind of helps because they can go maintain the cameras, but that's not the most efficient way to go about it. And they could do a lot more in the way of data refresh if they had some way of gathering that stuff. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Go ahead. You mentioned that the FAA is a long way away from the Amazon delivery part. Yes. Is it what you're doing with water samples? You're not flying it, the computer program is flying it? So is that, does that go into that nasty area? It could. Um, the, the difference would be that we're generally there. Um, and, we, and whenever, whenever we're experimenting with it, we're there and there's somebody who can take over control at any moment of time. In terms of it being deployed regularly for scientific research or journalism or community monitoring or things like that, yes, it's absolutely going to fall into that trap real quick. Now, it may get lucky in that um, it flies really low and it stays... Uh, Basically, if there's a manned aircraft down at that level, there's some really big problems going on that have nothing to do with the drone. Um, so we might get lucky in that below like treetop height, the FAA may just say, who cares? There are a lot of, there are a lot of countries in the world. So uh, for the international crowd here, um, the US kind of stands alone in this. The answer is no neighborhood. Um, most countries in the world don't have laws that anticipate this at all. So actually some of the most interesting stuff that we've been able to do in the last year has actually been um, my student Ben, who's been overseas. And here's a video, he was shooting a documentary film in India. 
And so he was flying around areas in uh, Gujarat province in western India. If you have ever seen the James Bond movie uh, Octopussy, that'll look familiar to you. That's the palace where they all went in the early part of the movie. So this is all with a DJI Phantom. It's, now this one has a, uh, a gyroscopically stabilized camera gimbal on it that um, really smooths the image out. If uh, I were to show you some video from this when I was, if I were flying around here, I forgot to turn the camera on, I'm sorry. But um, it's kind of herky-jerky because I'm kind of moving it around. Well, the gimbal will stabilize that. And honestly, it looks like somebody put a steady cam on the end of a pole. Um, he's flying this in a pretty significant uh, breeze. Uh, you can see he's pretty high. There are no rules in, uh, in India that kind of prevent this. Now, where I about wanted to call, I wanted to call him about chew his ass was this shot right here. The Phantom does really well at stabilizing at low altitudes, and so he can get away with stuff like this and be like right on the water. And I'm like, dude, if you drown another one of my quads, <laughs> don't come home. Um, he then, uh, I sent him to Africa to work with the um, Africa Skycam project, and, which is based at the Nairobi Star, and he sent me this picture. And I wanted to freaking choke him. This is not a zoo. This is a real wild rhino out on the African plain, and I am so freaking jealous it's not funny. You can see the shadow of the drone right there. So uh, he's got video of zebras and rhinos, and I think he said elephants as well. So I am so damn jealous. But uh, the Africa Skycam Project is actually doing stories about um, the Kenyan government is trying to get more people to embrace modern farming techniques, and so they're planting a lot more row crops. Well, when a rhino stumbles upon your field of crops, it's a buffet, and they can make a real mess of things. Um, also, rhinos are one of the most aggressively poached animals in the world, and so there's a lot of um, conservation efforts going on around them right now. Um, so uh, we've been able to do a lot of stuff in other countries. Uh, Countries that have rules that actually allow for commercial use um, generally fall into it's allowed, but it's highly restricted. So the UK is one. Uh, Australia is probably the furthest down the road. They have uh, rules that allow for them to cover sporting events. So they cover Aussie rules football. You know, the, the, the wire cams you see at, at US stadiums, they do that with drones. Weirdly for me, as an American, the thing that really weirds me out about that is that the, the CA, uh, that CASA, the Civil Aviation Authority of Australia, will not let them fly over the crowd, but they can fly over the players, no problem. And I'm thinking that here in the US, it would be totally the opposite. Go ahead and mutilate fans all you want. If you cut up Peyton Manning, you gotta die. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of amazing to me. But they do it, and they cover cricket matches, which I don't understand cricket, so I would be looking for things to liven up cricket myself. But, I said that as a joke, hopefully some of you tweeted that and tweeted at Derek Willis, who spoke before. He's a big cricket fan and I give him crap about it all the time. Um, yeah, we made, the, the, the real action in a lot of drone journalism is going on overseas because US law is so far behind. Australia is actually moving towards a system where if you're flying a device that's under five kilograms, here's a web form, fill it out, go out, have fun, do whatever you want. They don't care. They're regulating by the weight of the device, not the device itself. So we may see that, we may see what I'm actually afraid of with US rules is that they're gonna be so expensive and onerous that people are just gonna ignore them. They're already ignoring them. Um, and if the FAA wants to try to make this like getting a private pilot's license where it's gonna cost 10,000 bucks to be able to fly a drone around, no one's gonna do it. And the technology is already outstripping the FAA's ability to enforce any kind of regulations. So there's some real problems there. Um, just one second. My, a lot of my journalist friends believe that they have an absolute categorical First Amendment right to use these, that the FAA has no place to be able to say you can't use them, and that's not true. These things are the robot equivalent of shouting fire in a crowded theater, that reasonable place and time restrictions are allowable under the First Amendment, and that there is such a safety concern with these things, you are, it is not going to be a free-for-all once the FAA puts rules into place. Nobody wants it to be a free-for-all, trust me, because you don't want to be 
at the newsroom that has to explain to its readers why you just mutilated a child or something like that. We all want to be safe. We want to be responsible. And we need rules of the road to be able to do that, to understand what the parameters are and what's permissible and what's not. I'm just afraid that those rules are going to be so over the top that no one's going to follow them and then you're going to get some really bad actors making really bad policy real quick. You have another one? What are your top priorities for the next three months, six months, or a year? Uh, get a COA, get a COA, and get a COA. Um, but that's slightly jokey. Um, I want to get a COA. I want to get one really bad. We're getting close. Um, a certificate, of, a certificate of authorization. I'm sorry. That's the that's the that's the permit that allows me as an agent of the government to go out and fly one of these things. Now, by the way, that COA is completely anathema to journalism, completely, because I have to request to be able to fly in a specific property to a specific altitude and it takes 60 business days if everything goes right. So now I have to define a news event at a specific property 60 business days in advance. If any of you can do that, let's talk business opportunities. Forget this journalism crap, we're going to be rich. That's not to say there aren't stories out there to be done, but it's got to be at a property that I have permission to fly over and fly on and take off from. So it's not like I get to have a free-for-all because I'm an employee of a state institution. It's really, really, really limiting, but it's the only way that we have right now to go out and actually get practical experience without having to go overseas. So that's number one priority. Number two priority is actually getting journalism organizations and journalism educators uh, up to speed on the kind of legal things that are going on right now because there's an awful lot of lobbying going on with the FAA right now. And the players in this are agribusiness, defense contracting, law enforcement. I mean, we're talking the, you know, the big boys of lobbying. And they are pushing agendas that are profit-based and are not necessarily um, freedom of speech-based. And we as journalists and as journalism educators need to be very mindful of the things that are going on, not just in Washington and the FAA, but also in state legislatures. That state legislatures are doing some things that are pretty hostile to journalism and journalists using these things. So that's primarily it. Um, I suppose the third priority is just getting ready for uh, the November notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, I'm guessing I'm going to get busy around then. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Contributor video. Yep. Does a, a legit news outlet need to be concerned about liability if it accepts somebody, a hobbyist? I don't think so. I think there are some safe harbor provi provisions that are going to somewhat insulate you. But this is this this is going to get really quickly in an area of law that I'm not necessarily familiar with. Um, I would suppose that it would all depend on about how that video came about. If a, if a citizen went out and took video of something and successfully got it and came back and gave it to you uh, or sold it to you or something like that, you're probably in better shape than if you called somebody up that you knew who had one and said, hey, could you go out and do this? Because then they, became, they become an employee and you become the deep pockets in the lawsuit. So it's going to be a problem uh, or, or could be a problem. With us, when, when we thought that we could fly under hobbyist rules and when we were out flying around, the, the notion that we had was we were not doing research into how to build a better drone. So we were not doing university research uh, in that, in, into drones. We were just using them. I admit it's semantics. But um, the other thing was we had no commercial interest in what we were doing. We didn't have advertising on there. We weren't soliciting donations through it. We weren't doing anything like that. We were putting it on the Internet. And when any, whenever anybody would call me and say, hey, can we use your video? Can we license your, will you give us a license to your video? I would say no. But I am a really big fan of fair use. Huge fan of fair use. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And if you were to just use the video on YouTube that has a pretty permissive license on it, no one's going to come after you. Or to play these FAA games. Um, those are going to get really weird in the, in the coming years. And... Um, if people put them on, I mean, it, it falls into the kind of citizen-generated media anyway. Like, what are what are what are the rules around using a picture from Twitter, or what's the you know what's the rules around using a video from YouTube, and, and how you license that thing, and how you contact people, and things like that. It's going to fall into that as well. But where the real worry would come in is basically how you arrange to have that video. Did it just arrive at your place, and you're just a receiver of it, and then you're probably okay. If you arranged ahead of time, they're probably now nominally your your employee, and if something goes wrong, it's your ass. 
So at the beginning of this, you started talking about the fixed wing UAV as yep. your epiphany moment. Mm -hmm. So the kind of thing that flies up into surveying. Yep. But most of your talk has been about quadcopters. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how did you get from that moment of epiphany? Uh, just a logical kind of extension, just looking around at what was out there. I'm, 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 I'm deeply fascinated by underwater drones. The problem is we don't have a lot of water in Nebraska, which is kind of a problem. Um, there are folks who are working on uh, citizen-based underwater UAVs to do like monitoring of coral reefs or uh, outflow pipes into the ocean, things like that, that I think are, are, are really cool and I would be totally into that if I lived in a coastal area. Um, the fixed wings, uh, when we can get back outside, the, the reason I don't talk about fixed wings so much anymore is because I have one, it sits on my desk in pieces, actually it sits above my desk in pieces and I can't do anything with it because I can fly this thing around this room and show you and you get kind of the idea like real quick I can't fly a fixed wing around in here without smacking it right into the wall or anything like that. But fixed wings will be a lot more useful for data gathering and for aerial mapping because you can get 40 to 40 minutes to an hour of flight time depending on the wing and the lift and the battery and different characteristics. But 40 minutes kind of at a minimum. So you get a lot more air time. The problem is, I mean, in terms of photo and video production, the problem is it's constantly moving. You have to do orbits around a, around a fixed point if you're really interested in that fixed point where that thing you just stop, look, get the video, move around to the next one, stop, look, get the video. Um, it's not actually unreasonable. The, the old quad that we had, we could actually do it with autopilot and we could sit there with a laptop and a transmitter from the laptop and just say, go here and it would go over there. And it was actually a better pilot than we were. Um, but uh, we could tell it to go to a spot and actually turn the camera in a specific direction we could tell it to do orbits around a specific spot. We could basically automate any of the movements that you would need in kind of a journalism context. There's a brush fire going on and you want to do an orbit around a given spot, you just draw it on a map, tell it to go do it, and it would go do it. And it would actually do it better than, than you could as a human being. Um, but yeah, uh, drone journalists in the future are going to use a mix of these things they'll they'll, they'll if it's if it's a straight video production job then it's probably a quad or a, or a hex or something like that if it's higher needs more uh distance you need more flight time it's a bigger thing it's probably fixed wing how hard are they to fly and what makes them challenging um the, the the true irony of the faa's policy about not being able to fly around outside is this thing is vastly more safe outside than it is inside because there's a gps sitting right there and in gps mode it will fix itself to the ground like i can just let go of the sticks and it will hover and it will stay in this spot i could walk away and it would be fine the other thing it has in here is it, the, a lot of people are trying to define drone as having autonomous capabilities it can fly itself well this thing has some of that um, it has mo a, a limit limited autonomous capabilities it will do things to stabilize itself. It will do things to fix itself to the ground. It has what it's called intelligent orientation control, where if I turn it like this, this is forward. On, on older systems, so I have this. If I go forward, the thing goes forward. But if I yaw it to the left and I push forward, it's now going to this way, not forward to the device. And you can get turned around real fast. And in fact, most of the crashes that we've had have been because the thing got yawed a certain direction and we were trying to bring it back and we couldn't remap our brains quick enough to get turned around. Uh, with intelligent orientation control, that problem's solved. <coughs> forward is always forward, left is always left, back, forward, right, all that. The other limited autonomous capability that it has is a return to home function. If someone comes along and is just like, is a, is a serious anti-drone nut, and takes a Louisville slugger to this thing, like, I don't like you, smash. It will stop, it will go up 60 feet in the air, and it will fly back to its original takeoff point and land itself. It has a return to home function. It's not on by default, but it's not hard to turn on. Um, some systems have this, some don't. Some have better systems than that, some don't. Um, How much is that one? This is, uh, this is the Phantom One. You can get them for a little less than $500 right now. Uh, throw a $300 GoPro on it and you've got a pretty good video production platform. Uh, the Phantom 2s are the new ones. They get up to them closer to $1,000. Uh, really, if you want me to go down this road, I will sound like a used car salesman really quick. 
I have a drone that can fit your budget. You got a half a million dollars, I got you covered. You got $80, I got you covered. So, yeah, go ahead. I have a silly question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have a special relationship with the TSA, a very special relationship with the TSA, and it goes like this. They feel me up regularly. I get randomly searched a lot, and they also leave me love notes. Um, actually, to give you kind of an idea of, of, of the weirdness uh, that goes on right now is that these things are illegal for commercial use, right? The FAA says no. But if you go to B&H Photo, they'll sell you a GoPro, a DJI Phantom, and this wonderful Porta Brace hard case that I have up here as a package deal for all of your professional aerial photography needs. There are companies out there that are straight up selling this stuff to people, and you're not supposed to be able to use it. So we use these, these Porta Brace cases, their phone, we, we shove stuff down in there. Um, weirdly, the TSA will not let me uh, check the batteries, so I have to carry these on. So I check the drone, but I carry on the batteries. The irony is, is that you can actually build a pretty decently destructive device with lithium polymer batteries. So you give me a fork or a spoon and these things and I'll MacGyver you a bomb. Um, so I don't, I don't get that at all. But I have to take these things out of my bag and I have to put in a laptop and I have to have it all out there. And pretty much every time I go through the screening process, they look at these things and are like, what are those? And then they're like, you step over there and I get to be felt up. And yeah, that's, that's happening about, now until this trip, um, it was about 75% of the time that I was getting randomly screened. Um, so, um, I don't know, yesterday was my birthday, so maybe they were just feeling nice. They didn't even give me like a, a, a you know, a, a disdainful glance. I've seen, the, I've seen the secure baggage search area in three different airports, because they open that thing up and they're like, whoa. Now what's hilarious is that in Nebraska when it's happened, they open it up and they're like, yeah, we got an alert on this bag and we open it up and it's very clear that you packed this very specifically and we just want to make sure that we're putting it back in there the right way. I'm like looking for the candid camera cameras like what? But hey guys, thanks a lot. It looks like it's fine. Okay, goes on through. I, it, ultimately, I don't have a problem. It's just that's what I got to deal with. So I've, I've actually been keeping all of the baggage search notices that I get um, I'm about that thick into the stack now. Um, I expect to get a lot more. It's not, honestly, the, the biggest problem is the expense of the hard case. Other than that, it's fairly easy. You get kind of used to it after a while. So, yeah. Can you stick a GoPro on the little handheld guys if you get sued? No. No. Um, we, I've tried really hard to get a, an HD camera on that thing. Um, I don't know if you all have heard of a Mobius action cam. It's about the size of the key fob on your key ring, uh, and it'll shoot GoPro-esque HD video. Tried to strap that thing to it, couldn't get off the ground. Took all of the plastic housing off of it, stripped it down to just a lens, you know, basically the camera and the board still couldn't get it off the ground. They're, they're just, they're not powerful. They're just there to help kids learn how to fly. Go ahead. What's the... Fight to the death for it, let's go. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing a lot of kids that are huge. They lift like red cameras. And yep. Lenses, and they have goggles that you wear to see. FPV flying. Yep. But my, I seen this picture of this rhino. It, that's amazing. So I was actually just wondering, what is the range like that they control? Because obviously he's not standing in the field with the rhino. Um, but how far away can you be and still get that signal? Um, <laughs> it's far. Yeah. It's half a mile plus oh, wow. so uh, honestly it's farther than you can see it yeah I guess my question was if you can't see it yeah I, I mean people ask me well, how high can it go and I say it can violate FAA regulations it can at about 300 feet that thing gets really hard to see especially in the daylight it's really hard to see so I run a thing called maker hours which is a Friday afternoon open learning lab at UNL 
um, where kids can just work on digital projects and I'll help them out. And I, and I, and I haze them, I make them take a photo of their first thing. She built uh, her first website with Code Academy. He flashed his phone and put the glass uh, OS on there. Tony's gonna be a star someday, we got glass. But one thing I do is I haze them with the FPV gear and I make them take this. This is just a little security camera and we have a transmitter here in his hand and I make them put the goggles on and go walk around the hallways using the camera as their eyeballs and understand how limited your depth perception is. Now, I had one kid go out and do this and banged his head pretty good on a door and so now I, now I go out there and guide them a little bit. So keep the personal injury lawsuits to a minimum, but uh, yeah, FPV gear is, is pretty amazing. Um, the, one, the one commercial use that I have seen that absolutely blew my mind Yes. I probably spelled Schlitterbahn wrong. It may or may not work. Um, so there's this water park called Schlitterbahn. They're kind of all around the, the central U.S. And they're building a seven-story tall water slide. And... They did this promotional video for it that once you, this, this is kind of one of these things where when I was covering a lot of the environment stuff, you don't really know wetlands are there until you know what to look for and then you suddenly see them everywhere. Drone video is another thing where if you don't, if you know what you're looking for, I'm here to tell you right now, nothing in this video was shot with a manned helicopter. And you can tell right away because of the proximity. You can't get that close. You can't do that. You really, really, really can't do this next one here. This. You can't do this with a manned helicopter. Y'all, y'all don't know. I want on that thing, like, poison people need antidote. Like, that is the shit. I'm ready to go. It's probably 45 in Kansas City right now. That's bathing suit weather. Let's go. So you see why, this is why I think these things are inevitable. That's freaking amazing. And it cost nothing. Nothing. And you could not. Yep, see? Okay. Okay. Yes. So the Nebraska drought is on YouTube. It is. Views. Yep. But I don't know how many of them are FAA administrators. Yeah. Kids in trouble or have you? I, I wasn't clear. Maybe you yes, we got a cease and desist order from the FAA in July saying don't go outside and fly until you get permits. So you didn't have to take the video. Nope. Before. Nope. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. Because um, we would have screamed bloody murder about that. The funny story, I don't know exactly how the FAA found us. We weren't hiding. Uh, we've had probably 50 or 60 news organizations write about us. What really cracks me up is that one of them was the Kansas City Star, and the letter that we got was from the Kansas City office of the FAA. And part of me looked at that and went, oh shit, I'm going to Gitmo. I'm dead, oh God, I'm freaking out. And then I'm like, hey, wait a minute. The star just ran a story about us not that long ago, and this came from Kansas City. Hey, someone reads the paper. All right. <laughs> Journalism. So, yeah. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.